So we're, we're diving into chapter 7, and I don't want to say this is one of my least favorite chapters, but the, the, the even chapters tend to be my favorite, so this just happens to be an odd one. And the, 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 reason, the, the reason is that the, the even chapters you know, really dive into the, like the physics and the, and the mechanics, and the, the other ones are more just kind of historical in, in general, but that's it's okay. You need a, need a nice blend there. I'm going to get into my... Get into my notes. 101. Yeah, we have a lot of courses in this program. Yeah. A couple. Well, just a two-year program. I'm yeah. taking... Yeah. Other courses, huh? yeah. I'm completing the climate change studies minor this year. Yeah. There's there's others too have taught taught these guys. That's a degree, almost. I'm trying to do the uh, Vietnam trip. Oh, nice. Over winter. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to get into that. Three weeks in Vietnam, the six credits. Right. Sold. You should. You should. When I was in, when I was in, when I was in okay. Sorry, we're starting to lecture. Uh, <laughs> All right, so oil and gas, chapter seven. Here's a little bit of um, here's a little bit of geoscience, just to kind of let you know where the oil and gas I don't necessarily come from, but but are. Um, and here's one here's one other thing that's that's definitely worth mentioning. And this is something that I have recently learned from my own um, just correspondence with people working in the energy field. So just to back up slightly, chapter six, if, if you remember, was coal. Mm -hmm. Or was that chapter five? Chapter five. Chapter five. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Chapter five. There we go. Appreciate it. The previous chapter on fossil fuels <laughs> was coal. So that was chapter uh, five, yeah. So the point I'm trying to make is that coal is a solid hydrocarbon. Uh, chapter seven, oil and gas are um, fluids. Um, gas or natural gas is a gaseous fluid and oil is a liquid fluid. So liquids and gases are both fluids. They happen to be you know, two separate phases of matter, uh, solid being a third phase, plasma and the sun being a fourth phase, and apparently the Nobel Prize was just awarded to like three individuals who discovered yet another phase of matter. I don't know exactly what it is, but uh, <coughs> yeah. Well, check it out. I uh, wish I had time to take a deep dive into that. But that's just kind of one way to think about these things in, in broader terms. Um, and, and, you know, and why, you know, the, the, um, we don't see coal-fired steam engines running back and forth across the uh, United States. Still have in China apparently. There's their steam engine is still, you know, coal fired steam engine still running in China. Mm -hmm. But you just you, you look at like so you know, so oil being a fluid, much better, cleaner for transportation, etc. This is also why we, we don't see oil fired power plants either. Kind of strange we're starting to see gas fire gas turbines and Northwestern Energy was just on the radio this morning saying, hey, we're going gas fired. Yeah, it's cleaner and you can start and stop them qu more quickly than you can a coal fired power plant. So, um, you know, we, we can sort of see gas as sort of a, a bridge fuel, if you will, to 100% renewables. Elon Musk is also um, touting natural gas as, a, as the, the ideal rocket propellant. Um, so, just something, something to keep in mind there. Okay, but where is it? Um, oil and gas are less dense. They have a lower specific gravity uh, than water. Um, 
all of this, this cap rock and impermeable strata, these are just different types of rock that do, do not allow the gas and oil to leak up. Where did these come from in the per first place? Well, it's just a giant compost pile uh, on planet Earth. It was just, you know, giant amounts of biomass that were covered. Um, some of the gas, um, and, and this is also a little bit of a side topic, but um, very early, and I'll just show you this really quickly, very early in my research, um, I was in a slightly different life. I was looking into uh, protein evolution, and in 2008, uh, journal, I published a paper in the Journal of Molecular Evolution on um, a collagen that I discovered in a marine bacterium, which was kind of weird because normally you think of collagen as being necessary for your bones and your skin. And like, why would, um, why would there be collagen in a um, bacteria? Well, because here it is, a little tiny bacteria under the microscope. As it turns out, um, there are these sort of collagen fibers. It allows this bacteria <laughs> to hold itself together out in the ocean, in these giant blooms that, that we've seen before. No one had seen the collagen before. I went to find the genome for some of these other bacteria that live in the ocean near thermal vents. As it turned out, um, the majority of the genomes for bacteria living near thermal vents at the bottom of the ocean were not publicly held. The, the, the genomes were held by petroleum companies. They, they had, uh, yeah, it was weird, like you, you, you can't, you, maybe you could buy it, but you couldn't find it. They, they had, um, you know, done some exploration, found these bugs, whatever, and now the, the genomes lived in the labs of the private companies rather than the public sector. It's very similar to when the, hu when the Human Genome Project was happening with the Venter versus, um, who's the guy, who's the public guy, Francis? Uh, anyway. Um, the NIH was sort of competing with Craig Venter to publish the human genome fastest. So it was sim similar competition, public versus private uh, competition for the genomes. Because it could be that, s that some of these gases are still being manufactured by microorganisms that live underground. Do you know? I don't know. Yeah. So that, that's, that's an open question. You know, it, could it be that if you have a... Um, very hardy, very small. This is, you know, taken under an atomic force microscope. Very small organism. Could it be still making methane from the other hydrocarbon? You know, chewing through the carbon bonds, the um, hydrogen bonds, et cetera, and just making uh, gas. So that was just one little exploration into the, the sort of the bridge between biology. Th these, um, you know, these bugs diverged. I think I have a little tree of life here somewhere. So I did a little genomic analysis to see how long ago, um, you know, in millions of years, these, these organisms sort of diverged from our own ancestors to sort of, you know, where did this collagen come from? But anyway, just one little peek into my own uh, past and the sort of the tie between molecular biology, which you know, is responsible for a lot of the fossil fuels that we see now, and energy. Okay, so the cap rock is here, and, and, and this is, so where, where are these humps coming from? Well, tectonic plate movement. Uh, where do those come from? Just, you know, momentum on the Earth's surface, tidal forces, the moon is yanking the crust back and forth, to and fro all the time. Um, so here's just buckling. Um, here's another way for <clears throat> oil to get, to get trapped. There, note that gas is not being trapped here. Basically, you've got a fault. You know, you've just got a, um, a crack or the gas is going to uh, leak out, but not so much that the, the oil can come through. And then finally, here's a, uh, a salt dome. So this is another formation that is impermeable. And, uh, and I don't know all the physics behind salt dome form formation, but 
Um, it's you know it's coming up. Did you guys know geologists know the? Probably had a geologist. Or well, How the salt dome forms? I just don't know the the physics of it. If it's just like a stalag, uh, you know, stalagmite or. So it's just seawater coming out of solution. Yeah. I've never seen domes. I've seen formations, like giant layers of salt, but I've never seen a dome. Yeah. Well, anyway, so I'm just going with what I know, not not being a special in the field. But the point is that the the liquid phase can be trapped between these two other impermeable uh, solid phases. Yeah. Okay. Here we are. Yeah. So here's um, here's here's James um, James Paraffin Young. And if if we go, let's just take a look at the chemical formula for paraffin. I always like to just go and, and um, it doesn't really make sense to me until I can sort of see the. Uh, the chem chemistry behind behind it. Uh, paraffin wax. This is what I was thinking when I heard paraffin. Yeah, that's what it is. Derive so it's derivable from petroleum or coal, mixture of hydrocarbons. Okay, so it's it's somewhere between twenty and forty carbon atoms long. Octane being, uh, you know, being eight. And you, you've all touched it, you know, it's, it's just like what's in, uh, what's in candles. And it, it's long enough that it's a solid. So, you know, in this, you know, if we go back here, um, in this oil, you've got all kinds of uh, hydrocarbons. You know, you, you've, you've, you've got uh, octane all the way up to tars, but uh, somewhere in between, 20 and 40 is this nice, uh, nice paraffin that we use for, for wax. Burns cleanly, so neat little technology. Here's, uh, okay, so here's a good looking um, chemical structure. So one, two, three, four, five, six, et cetera, all the way out. So long chain hydrocarbon. Nice thing is, it's just, uh, it's just carbon and hydrogen, pretty simple. Same thing is true of, of the you know the, a lot of the plastic bottles that we use uh, HDPE polyethylene carbon and hydrogen pretty simple well there they are holding your holding your water Check, pick your poison okay so here's um, they had a relatively low uh, melting point too yeah yep that's what I noticed about it yeah they do and, and typically the um, the shorter uh, the shorter the chain, the the lower the melting point. You know what I don't get is when uh, grocery stores keep them outside during the summertime. That sun hits the whole stack of them. Do you yeah. think about the heat generating and the, the leaching of the plastic into the water? Oh, you're you drinking the plastic bottles. Oh yeah. Drinking yeah. plastic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, just just to. You know, my own mission, I was up at uh, Flathead Lake over the weekend. I was working on a dock, and a button fell right off of my shirt. Plastic button. So, I, you know, like, wh what do you do? There I go. My, my, my plastic button is now in Flathead Lake. So uh, how, how long is the thing going to be there? Uh, it's an issue. I mean, I don't know. Two and a half years. Oh, really? You think the it'll turnover rate in Flathead is the fastest of any lake its size. Really? Water. The turnover rate for water is the shortest of any lake that size. It only takes 2.2 years for water coming in to exit. Okay. So, so, so is my, not very long. So is my button going to go out? Yes. Of the, okay. So it won't be in the end up, uh, <laughs> Pacific. Okay. So my, my button's on its way to the Pacific. The lake monsters are going to get you. To yeah. the gyres. It's always way of the jar. Yeah. Our, our aquifer <laughs> itself underneath us moves between two and four feet a day. I don't doubt it. It's one of the fastest moving aquifers and cleanest around. No, I don't doubt it with all the That's why the and university that. uses it for cooling. Yeah. Okay, so here we go. Early days of petroleum. Um, I love this picture. If you think back to our very first day in the lecture, this is... This is more or less the, the date that I was referring to. We said that uh, 
petroleum exploration, we started going gangbusters about 150 years ago. So very early oil rig in Pennsylvania, <laughs> Titusville, 1859, <coughs> you know, in, in the U.S. <coughs> you know, and then once, um, you know, once the oil comes out, it, it, once, once you start heating it, and um, we'll get into this a little more in the, in the course, once you start heating it, the lighter things go up, the heavier things stay down, and now you've basically got a distillery for um, getting access to, uh, to fossil fuels. Okay, um, there's a few other things um, right here. I'm just going to read really briefly um, box 7.2 on page 218. Uh, the oil price shocks of 1973 and 1979. Uh, a lot of people say, well, when, you know, when did oil peak? And um, there are many answers to that question. And it's, it's and you, you can look at supply and demand from a couple different standpoints. One is what's the what's the supply on planet Earth? You know, how much is there? The other one was like, what's the supply in the U.S. oil reserve? What's the supply in the Saudi oil reserve, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of different ways to look at that. But um, Box 7.2 uh, talks a little bit about this. So the USA was the world's largest oil producer from 1900 right through the 1970s. And at that point, it wasn't like our technology got worse, like some, you know, the, the machines didn't break. The oil peaked on this continent in, in the mid-70s. You know, you start, you know you're, you're, these, these, um, these nice little oil pockets, they're, they're finite, you know, and once you suck all the oil out of them, that's why it's not sustainable because it takes so long to, re to yeah. generate itself. And the, and the ratio we've, we've discovered in, uh, on the first day of class, it's a 10 million to 1 ratio. Oh. We're, we're pulling it out 10 million times faster than it's being made. Okay. So, um, but to go on, uh, right through the 70s, in 1935, U.S. produced about 60% of the world's oil and was a major exporter. The world oil price was effectively controlled by a very few large, mostly U.S. oil companies. And there's a neat little uh, reference there, and you can see that the authors use just about the same reference style that I do. They just use the word C. Don't use the word C in your prints. Just, just cite the authors. We know what you, what you mean. Anyway, it's Drollis and Greenman, 1898. In 1960, some other companies or, or other producers, Iran, Iraq, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, and Venezuela set up OPEC to secure fair and stable trade of petroleum producers. They were later joined <laughs> by a number of other, mainly Middle Eastern partners. Um, as can be seen from figure 1.1, this is all the way back to, to the first uh, chapter, the world oil price was low. In fact, real terms, the lowest it had been since the Depression. Very cheap oil, very large cars, very, very large Cadillacs in the U.S. The big flares in the back. Yeah, big the flares in the back, and I'd um, love to get one of those and uh, <laughs> convert it into an electric vehicle. There are lots of yeah. real estate up there for solar panels, too. Mm -hmm. Flywheels, the whole thing, fuel cells. Okay. Anyway, um, most have been since 1931. World annual primary production had quadrupled. That's, impre that's amazing. World annual primary production quadrupled in 20 years between 1950 and 1970. So the technology has just got better and better. Okay, OPEC's concerns reached a head in 1973. U.S. oil production had peaked, and the U.S. was now having to import oil, rot row. Was oil underpriced? Were the members of OPEC getting a fair price? So, in October 1973, a, a long simmering war <coughs> between Israel and its neighbors, Egypt and Syria, broke out. The Yom Kippur War, this was of global importance since Israel had the backing of the U.S. while Egypt had the backing of the Soviet Union. The Arab, so it's like a big game of, um, what's that? Um, the, what's, the, what's the game? Risk. Not good, because it was real. 
Uh, Egypt ended the backing of the Soviet Union. The Arab members of OPEC decided to use the oil weapon in support of Egypt and Syria. Shut off the tap. They announced price rises and production cuts, which would increase every month. A peace deal between the warring countries was eventually brokered on January 1974. Some of the production cuts were lifted, but oil prices did not fall. It had become obvious that the world could afford to pay more for its oil. The average price for 1974 was three times that it had been in 1973. So what? Tripled the price. In just one year? Yeah, in one year. Tripled the price Is in that one year. when there, all the shortages was going on in America? Because my mom used to yeah. that there was a shortage where you had to wait in line for yeah. gas and something. Yeah, it was. I mean, it's, it's not so much there was a shortage of oil. There was just now a shortage of money to pay for the oil. Okay. And, like, the amount of oil in the world hadn't gone down. Just the... the, 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 the Manufacturing of it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because well, I still you know, remember gas. Gl global economics. Under a dollar a gallon. Yeah. Then in 1979 came the Iranian Revolution. The country's oil output, about 8% of the global toil, total, dropped dramatic, dramatically. So, you know, when war breaks out, you know, you're, no, one's, no one's going to work keeping the oil rig pumping. They're, you know, busy dodging bullets. That's Iran, you said? Iran, okay. 1979. Matters got worse in the following year, 1980, when the neighboring country of Iraq attacked Iran, destroying much of the oil infrastructure. The world oil price peaked in January 1981 at nearly 10 times in real terms what it had been in the summer of 1970. So in 10 years, it goes up by a factor of 10. Okay, although subsequent extra supplies of oil from the North Sea, Russia, and Alaska produced the world, reduced the world oil price, the price rises of 73 and 79 have led to a profound effect on oil consumption across the globe, as, as we saw in Chapter 2. Okay. So that's kind of the, the big picture. And it all, in some ways, started with one, it's not exactly the Beverly Hillbillies, mm -hmm. but, you know, just backyard drilling, and up comes the bubbling crew. Yeah? Um, is it, when did we put sanctions on Iran, then, with their oil and all that? Okay, so if you want a good read, this is what kind of got me interested in this topic. I'm not trying to... No, it's not. This is totally relevant. Um, this, this guy's book, Clark, um, right here, and I didn't, I didn't realize this until reading it, but, um, so we, we went off the, the gold standard it's, at some point, I don't know, Nixon era or whatever, and it's just, ah, you know, gold's great, but that's not, we're not going to tie the dollar to it. We essentially tied the dollar to oil, and, um, that's, you know, the, the, globally recognized or whatever currency for so and in nine in two what was it um late 2000 2001 the euro was was getting stronger as a, as a currency and according to what's his name william r clark saddam hussein said i'm going to start selling my oil in euros because europeans pay more for it because they're more, they're just careful with it. Well, plus by, by the liter, too, not the gallon. Yeah, the liter versus the gallon, I'm not sure if that has a, a heck of a lot to do with it because they're still selling it in barrels. Right. Still buying it in barrels. Um, and, you know, you just saw the, the euros, and here it is, there's, it's the dollar versus the euro, and there's George Bush, and there's Tony Blair, you know, <laughs> ready to start squirting gasoline on them like in the Zoolander 1 movie or something, I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, but really, you know, according to Clark, that, that was the final straw that led to the uh, <clears throat> Iraq invasion. It was obvious that when Iraq was invading Kuwait, sorry, not playing fair, at least in physical terms, but then they started messing with it in economic terms, and that's when um, the gloves kind of came off. Okay. According to Clark. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. All right. So, what have we got? Ten minutes left? Man, we've been Five. Five? Ten. Ten? We've been cranking today. Ten, yeah. We've covered a lot. We covered summary two, summary three, 
Problem set one, we've covered, we've covered oil, now we're on to gas, which is, um, well, very interesting as well. Um, let's, just, let's just take a look at how this stuff is, uh, how this stuff is found. Because it's down there, underground. And here's what you, here's what you might do. Um, and maybe you've done this before. If you ever tried to hang pictures on the wall in your house, you might go and tap on the wall. And if it sounds hollow, then <laughs> you don't put the nail in there. And if it, start, if it sounds more solid, that's probably where the two by four stud is. And you whack the nail in there. That's where you can hang your, your pot or whatever. So same thing, just a little more sophisticated. This is a three-dimensional version of that where an acoustic wave is uh, sent from an exploration uh, vessel. These waves go out more or less as spheres, you know, in the same way. It's just, it's just something like somebody yelling or, or talking. These waves go out as spheres, and they will, they will bounce off. And j just in the same way, in this, this room where we're sitting right now, light is bouncing off the walls. Some of it goes straight through the window. Some of it actually bounces off. So what's happening is just this three-dimensional imaging game where you, you send out the, the sound waves and depending on the, the boundaries, the phase boundaries, thinks right back to the beginning of lecture, we're looking at solid, liquid, gas, phase boundaries, that's where the wave comes back. And so this is just a giant uh, CAT scan or more like a, uh, a Doppler scan of, of, the, uh, of the Earth. So the hydrophones are just listening. Each one is set up to a computer with a, with a timer on it. So you know when you when you yell here, uh, or, or similar analogies an echo, you yell across a canyon. You can time how long it takes to get back. It's basically to give you a, an under underground map of where these different uh, phases of matter exist. So on the one hand, kind of simple. On the other hand. Uh, Relatively sophisticated so how did they and complex. In Pennsylvania, where it I don't think there was a whole lot of decision. I think in Pennsylvania, it was it was literally just about Beverly Hillbillies up from the ground came some bubbling crude. I mean, the the oil was just thirty or forty feet below the surface. So they were probably drilling for like a well or anything. Yeah, well, no, it was, it, they knew it was there, but it was more or less leaking out. <clears throat> Back east, also, like when we bought houses, you ended up with the mineral rights. Whereas people back west, like us over here, we don't own the mineral rights out when we buy the house. Yeah. I, I know what you're saying. And so when a person buys the house, they own everything underneath it too. Whereas like we own a house now, if you we only own like ten feet and anything else below is not ours. So your so your neighbor could come in and drill just like this, is what yeah. you're saying. Yeah, that's exactly what me and Tyler did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, anyway, this and this stuff. I mean, you can you can see this type of drilling. You know, even in your backyard. There was there was a um, group out in my backyard last summer doing some horizontal drilling, and it's it's kind of wild the way uh, this this stuff works. I'm like, how the hell the heck do you do that? But if you just imagine a, a, a drill head, and if it's perfectly symmetric and it's just going through material that's you know homogeneous, it's just going to drill straight ahead. But if, if, um, if instead you put sort of a shoe or some, some kind of uh, cup or some kind of plate, it yeah, it, the, you, the, the drill is going to basically, it's going to just act like a shoehorn yeah, going it, through. You can turn 360, so if you want to go down, you just turn the head down, and then it'll start going down. Yeah. If you want to go sideways, it'll bring it sideways. Yeah, and so there's a sensor. There's a, there's a sensor on the end of it, too, saying, okay, where is this thing? And then, you know, depending on uh, where you want to go, you'll just take that... Um, just take that shoe, you want to go that way, put it on the side, there you go. You want to put it on the top, and you, you can head down. So you've got uh, control. You're like, well, how does that metal bend? Well, you know, it's metal. It bends. Giant, giant... Uh, over, over a thousand. Yeah, obviously. yeah, giant pole vault with, with a hole down the middle. Well, plus, uh, initially, the will have between a 1.5 and a 2.5 degree angle bend on it to help it curve. Yeah. So, pretty, pretty cool physics, pretty cool engineering that allows us to do this. Um, so, as, as the oil gets tougher to fire, we build fancier and uh, fancier platforms uh, to go after it, but really the whole point is to be able to 
get down and, and get into the, um, the, the seabed. You can also see how um, the deeper you get, the more challenging it becomes. You can also see, like, you know, why would that rupture, you know, the deep water horizon rupture happen? Well, there's a lot of pressure. There's a lot of, there's a lot of water pressure. They just made, like, a movie on it. Yeah. It just came out, I think, I want to watch it. Yeah, that movie. Rewriting um, history. movie looks like a good one. So, anyway, there you go. Oh, yeah, this is a Ooh. British textbook, too, so they're probably going to cover up plenty of the... Uh, <laughs> the British conspiracy. Uh, I don't know. I don't know about <laughs> that. No, these, these guys, you know, they're, these, you know, the authors of this book are academics. They don't have a whole lot to, to worry about. Um, so, also... <laughs> <laughs> Just, <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> That's right. We can say whatever we want, you know. <laughs> Don't worry about grass students not updating web pages. That's right. <laughs> Our concerns are <laughs> trivial. No. Um, but anyway, this is this is another thing to uh, you know to consider in in terms of what um, what's proven, probable, possible. So th these are things that we've gone out with, <coughs> you know, with this type of technology. They're there, and then the next question is, um, you know, can you drill for them or not? You know, what, how, how big a platform are you going to have to build to get down to them? And these are other just, hey, somebody's done some geoscience. There must be other uh, resources out there we just haven't found. Oil deck, Texas, spindle top, 1901. So, again, just gravity and the Earth's crust uh, squirting the stuff out of the ground. There's so much pressure deep down there. Yeah. It's like shaking a soda. Yeah. Yeah, that, you know, pop that to that rock and out it comes. Same thing would happen if you, you know, drilled into the um, Earth's magma. It's just, you know, making a little mini volcano. That's all it is. Russia has the deepest well right, or hole that they're drilling right now. Yeah. It's, I, I can't remember how, do you know how far down it is? It's like four miles. Maybe. Something like, yeah, it's miles. And miles Maybe down. kilometers. Yeah. To the point where, like, they can't drill anymore because the temperature is so hot, it's just messing everything up down the hole. Guys, one last thing here before I let you go. Um, this figure is accompanied with um, enhanced oil recovery. It's mentioned that CO2 is sometimes used in that enhancement. I just learned recently there is a 200-mile... Um, CO2 pipeline between Wyoming and Montana uh, for doing exactly this. It's kind of wild. So, you know, it's one sort of solution for, you know, taking CO2. You know, it's coming out of the power plant anyway. Let's just send it, uh, you know, send that CO2 underground for more. To bring up more, uh, you know, liquid petroleum. Okay. Um, that's what I got. We got through 7.4. We will cover some of the technical details of oil refining and other gas technologies on Thursday. That was a good one. That was good. Yeah, thanks for the good Yeah, picture. yeah. Have a nice day. All right. You too, see you, Matt.